Okay, so uh, this is the third installment. Uh, I think you guys already heard the spiel. You know, it uh, all started with me looking at uh, laser printer uh, etching boards and uh, how they use PWM and they turned out to use a buck converter. And I started playing around with a buck converter and led me down a whole bunch of rabbit holes trying to figure out why the buck converter wasn't working in LT Spice. And that leads us to today's talk, which is um, about the uh, uh, transceiver Pete and I were working on back in, I think, 2018 or circa 2018, uh, around that time. We started working on this, and it's more of a log. It's not really anything. I'm just going to talk about what what the issues I had. So, you know, in our last episode, you know, last talk, we talked about the buck converter and how I needed a um, a uh, high side bootstrap and how there are chips available to do this and to get the buck converter and is able finally to get the buck converter to work based on this design here. So everyone was all happy and good. And that uh, before I figured out it was this high, high side bootstrap was the issue, I got down the rabbit hole looking at uh, MOSFETs and uh, I learned that there's all these straight, not straight, but there's all these capacitors or, or capacitances involved and they're uh, denoted here in the um, data sheet. This is for the IRF 510. And I uh, did a simulation where I created a little model of a MOSFET to simulate the, the input impedance seen here, looking into the MOSFET. And I compared the two and it comes out almost identical. So I was able to get, calculate what the capacitances were here. And as you could see um, at uh, higher frequencies, the MOSFET basically shorts out because it's got capacitors. And at a high frequency, the capacitor represents a short, right? So then I went on to look at, say, okay, well, if the IRF 510 shorts out at higher frequencies, what about some other MOSFETs? So I went through and I looked at some other MOSFETs, and sure enough, they all kind of short out at higher frequencies. And there were a couple where you got fairly high, higher frequent, uh, higher impedances, here's, you know, almost 150 ohms at, uh, uh, at the 10 meter band um, at uh, 29 megahertz. You got, you know, 100, uh, just over 100 uh, ohms of impedance, of, uh, of magnitude of impedance. And uh, so this, you know, could be a potential MOSFET to use in a power amp. So that led me to go back to my Dueling 612 transceiver and a power amp and, uh, you know, look at maybe improving that. So, so in this talk, what I'm going to talk about, just talk a little bit about the 612 and uh, the power amp and going to talk about the ugly rears its head. Yeah, that's a picture of Eric from high school. And uh, um, then, you know, I took a look at some popular power amps and I thought, let me pick those uh, power amps and then uh, maybe start analyzing them and substituting in MOSFETs to see which one would work out the best. So the Dueling 612, it's, I called it the Dueling 612 D612, and it's based on Pete Giuliano's uh, Sudden 40. And here's a design of his Sudden, Sudden 40. It's, uh, it's got two SA... Uh, six, it's six, not 602, 612s. They don't make 602s anymore. So they're um, 612s. And I, they're, because there are two of them, I, I said it's dueling, dueling 612s, right? And so he built this uh, sudden 40 meter transceiver. And so, you know, we talked about it. And uh, I thought, you know, this is a cool design. Maybe there is a way I could make this into a, um, a multi band transceiver. So I gotta bug up my ass, a boomer, you know, about these trans transceivers because they're all, you know, single frequency, and I understand why it's tuned components, but you know, it's 
it'd be really nice to have a transceiver that's you know multi frequency, uh, multi band. So what I did was I took uh, Pete's design and I came up with some design goals. One of which I changed the nine megahertz uh, IF here. He used a filter from the GQRP club. They sell these nine megahertz filters and uh, he used that. Um, I decided to use the 12 megahertz IF and that's why I wrote that uh, program, that little program in Java, which analyzes uh, combinations of uh, IFs and RFs and VFOs and not VFO, uh, uh, oscillators and look to see whether anything folds back uh, and you'll get birdies coming back in. So I wrote that program and uh, 12 megahertz looked promising. And then I found out that if you look at the bit X40, uh, let's see, I'm deleting some files here. Um, yeah, if you look at the bit X40, it, it uses a 12 megahertz uh, IF which was kind of interesting. So, and I also wanted to use, um, I also wanted to use pluggable bandpass filter and, and low pass filters, as opposed to having relay switching between them. It would be so much easier to plug in, oh, come on, uh, plug in uh, modules. At just I was just trying to keep the size as small as possible. And I just, I wanted to use op amps because there's a lot of, you know, discrete components. And I felt, you know, op amps, you know, there are op amps out there that you can use. And uh, the other thing too, is this was a fixed gain, uh, uh, transmit, uh, gain transmit power. It was a fixed transmit power and I wanted to be able to control it. So I wanted to be able to control the gain at the preamp, the RF preamp, and as well control the power output. And also I wanted to use a LM386 as opposed to using a dis discrete amplifier. I wanted to put a S meter, uh, power meter and SWR meter all integrated in it. And I wanted to use the Park SIGGEN board that we have just repurpose the software in it and use that to control the uh, radio. So this is what I ended up on. And this is what uh, Pete and I built. Um, starts off with, you know, you've got the SIGGEN, which is controlling uh, various things. It's controlling a relay to switch power between transmit and receive. And it's also using that to switch the uh, antenna relays to go from transmit to receive. And it's got a couple of relays here where it's switching uh, inputs and outputs uh, to and from the 612. So if you follow the chain, the receive chain, it comes through the relay, hits uh, two uh, LT1253 op amps that have a gain control. And that way I can adjust the gain. It's got a bandpass filter and it's got a transformer to match the 50 ohm uh, bandpass filter to the SA612, which I, I think it's 1300 or 1500 ohms. And uh, so the relay switches that to the uh, 612. Then the 612 has a transformer to match it to the um, impedance of the crystal filter. And uh, uh, same thing the other side, it's got a, a same thing crystal filter, uh, um, a transformer to match the 612. So this 612 is uh, taking it uh, to the, um, taking the input to the 12 mega, megahertz IF. And this uh, 612 here is now taking it back down to audio. And so uh, the relay switching it to the audio amp, the um, AF audio amp goes to speaker and then I've got an S meter circuit and that goes to the SIGGEN to record the, uh, the uh, S meter reading. And then on transmit, similar, you've got a push to talk which is connected to the SIGGEN. So once that push to talk is enabled, the SIGGEN switches the power from receive to transmit and controls these relays. So you've got a mic amp that uh, goes to the 612. The SIGGEN is going to generate a frequency. It's going to take it up to the, to the uh, 12 megahertz IF, and it's going to select the upper or lower sideband and take that out to the 612, the next 612, which is then going to lift that up to whatever uh, 
band you want it on. And that comes out a transformer, which matches it to the 50 ohms of the bandpass filter. That goes through two LT1253 op amps, again with variable gain, goes to a driver, uh, goes to a power amp, a low pass filter, goes to a SWR bridge that feeds to the SIGGEN to read the uh, power and SWR. And uh, then that goes to the antenna. So, so that's basically in a nutshell how it works. And this is the schematic of the power amp because that's what I want to focus in on, on uh, this talk. So here's the uh, LT spice of the power amp. It's got the uh, IRF uh, 510. Uh, 2219 uh, uh, driver. Then it's got the two op amps, the 12, uh, 1253. Those are linear technology um, uh, uh, op amps, and they're video op amps, low noise. And I lifted this configuration here from the uh, DDS 60. Uh, that Midnight Design Solutions uses, except they're using AD 8008's op -amps. I chose to use the LT1253, uh, number one, because it's a native uh, op, op amp in uh, LT Spice, and I had a bunch of them kicking around, and they're discrete. They're 8-bit uh, dip packages, so I chose to use those. So, uh, and if I did a Bode, well, it's pronounced Bode, but I call it Bode, Bode, whatever. If you do a Bode plot of it, you'll see that uh, it rolls off quite substantially. And I later on, I'll talk a little bit about these Bode plots, that they're, they could be very, very misleading. But you'll see it's got quite a bit of roll off uh, here. Um, you're, you're dropping from 60, you got about 20 dB of roll off. Now, it just so happens with because I can adjust the gain here, I've got pots, I can bring this piece back up and I can get, uh, you know, almost five watts out at these uh, higher frequencies. So here's what the board looks like. Uh, so here's the RF front end here. There's the RF amp coming in to, with the two pots to adjust the two op amps. There's the bandpass filter coming in, transformer, the relay that switches it to the SA612. Here's the transformer to the crystal filter, transformer to the other SA612. You can barely see it, it's dark there. Then the relay that switches that to the audio uh, portion um, of, the, uh, uh, radio, of the radio here. And it's got a couple of... Uh, it's got a, a one pot here for adjusting the audio gain and another pot for calibrating uh, the S meter. And then on uh, transmit, you've got the mic amp here, right? And you've got adjustable gain, or I could adjust the gain of the mic amp, goes through the relay, switches to the SA612, same thing, blah, 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 through the crystal filter, relay switches it to a transformer, goes to another, bandpass filter, and here's the output uh, pre-driver, the LT1253 here, two op amps, two gain controls, uh, the uh, 2219 driver, the IRF510, low pass filter, here's the bias, that adjusts the bias for the uh, uh, IR, IRF510, bandpass filter, and here's the bridge. And uh, those, uh, Two wires are uh, taking the uh, um, measurements from the bridge to the uh, SIGGEN. And so in a nutshell, that's what it was. And so I was able, you know, here's a contact I made uh, using FT8 as is. Here it is on um, at 80 meters. You can see I'm putting out four watts, about four watts and change. SWR is one to... Uh, uh, 1.02, which is pretty damn good. And uh, so I'm, I was able to make a contact, but I didn't realize, but there was a bug in this. So here it is, making a contact in 40 meters. You can see my, you can barely see my call sign there. There's a video I made on my channel where you could see this. Here it is on 30 meters, 
And again, there's a bug in this. And here it is on 20 meters. And uh, here's, uh, you know, 20 meters, I'm putting out four watts SWR of 1.45. And I think I was using my off-center fed dipole. That was before it got ripped down in a, in a storm. So spurious emission rears its ugly head. So now just to um, give context here, in the US, um, if you look at what the FCC says, it says the mean power of any spurious emission must be at least 43 dB below the uh, fundamental emission. So it's kind of like DBC. So that's like 43 dBC. DBC is, uh, you know, dB below the carrier, dB relative to, to the carrier, right? So it's, this is kind of like a DBC uh, measurement, right? So if you look at the uh, ITU, the ITU says, you know, it should be 80 dBC, right? And in Canada, I had a Dickens finding this. Finally, I stumbled across it. Uh, Industry Canada says it has to be 43 dB plus 10 log of the power or 70 dB, which is less stringent. Uh, and that's basically anything outside of 250 percent of the authorized bandwidth. So it just, so this is what, you know, harmonics, it's going to fall. Uh, that's what uh, is going to drive harmonics. So, you know, if you look at five watts, that's uh, 43.7. And for 10 watts, it's 44. So I said, okay, let's just say 44. Let's go with 44 uh, dBC. So from my main carrier that I'm going to be putting out, all harmonics must be 44 uh, DB below that. So the, the issue I had once, you know, um, I'd made those contacts, I came back and I think I was at Dayton and I picked up a publication at Dayton and do I have a, no, I didn't put the picture of the publication, but I got a little booklet about FCC regulations and it was at Dayton, I think in 2019 probably. And uh, I was thumbing through it and I came across this 43 dB limit. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder what's going on. So I connected the D612 to my SA and I was surprised to see that, you know, it was in the 30 dB. It, there was, I think one band was over 40 uh, dB and uh, most of the other bands, the harmonics, were in the 30s, like 38, 35, 38, 39 dB, which meant the, uh, you know, it wasn't legal. This uh, radio, you know, could not be put on the air. And I had to adjust quite, I put quite a bit of gain on the that pre-driver, the LT uh, 1250, uh, 1253 op amps to get four or five watts uh, output. And when I adjusted the gain there, the harmonics got even worse. So with the same gain, I'm not touching the um, op amps at, at all at five watts. I was getting five watts at seven megahertz and I'd get 1.7 watts at 14 megahertz. So there was quite a bit of roll off here and that should come as no surprise based on my previous presentations where you saw that these MOSFETs basically are acting like a short at uh, higher frequencies. So bottom line, the power amp was too dirty and uh, and that made a lot of sense because even making those contacts, it was very difficult. I had to keep trying and trying and trying. So finally I threw that radio against the wall and I abandoned it and I never looked at it until recently. I started to uh, re-look at that. So, so after, you know, looking at, you know, MOSFETs and the, um, uh, capacitance involves in them, I thought, okay, well, you know what, maybe I should revisit my D612 and I should dust it off and find a better uh, power amp. So I went, you know, searching around and I looked at all kinds of designs and basically they're, they're the same. They're all the same. They're, there's a few little subtle differences, but all these amps are the same. It's either a single uh, IRF 510, or it's a push-pull configuration. 
And so I, you know, I thought, okay, let me focus on the Bidex and uh, Han Summers, because Han Summers, he's got, uh, you know, uh, he's got uh, quite a bit of success. He's got a, a 10 watt power amp kit and uh, looks very, very promising and puts out some good power. So I thought, let me focus on these um, power amps. So if you take, I'm not gonna go through the schematics, I'm just showing you that uh, this was the original BIDX 20 power amp. It had a 2219 driver, IRF 510, similar to what I'm using in mine. And uh, if you do the Bode plot, you know, this is what you would get. You would get, you know, a roll off of 15 dB between, um, you know, 1.9 megahertz to 29 megahertz. But I, I couldn't understand, as I figured out how to do measurements in uh, LT Spice, uh, I could do measurements of frequency of gain uh, doing transient analysis as opposed to doing AC analysis. And I learned something about AC analysis versus transient analysis. When you use AC analysis, it assumes a small signal model. And number two, it assumes a linear, uh, linear behavior. So if your MOSFET has any nonlinear behavior or any components have a nonlinear behavior, the Bode plot does not account for it in LT Spice. So that's why I'm, I saw quite a bit of difference here between if you look at uh, 29 megahertz, you know, I was seeing 30 dB of gain using a Bode plot. But when I did a transient analysis, I was seeing 49 dB again. And I was seeing 65 dB gain at 1.5 megahertz, you know, and here I'm seeing 45. So it's a huge difference. So, uh, but bottom line, I'm seeing 16 dB roll off across the bands here with the BIDX 20 amp. So if you look at the newer BIDX uh, 40 amp, same 2219 IRF 510, but uh, he introduces a, a 849 uh, transistor here uh, as a preamp, a pre preamp or a pre driver or whatever you want to call it. And if you look at the plot of that, I'm not even going to talk about the Bode plot because it's garbage. I'm just going to talk about the transient analysis I did and the um, the gain I saw here, and you see I'm getting a 5 dB roll off. So the BIDX 40 amp looks as if it performs better across the bands, uh, just as is. And I, I didn't, I'm not substituting any parts. I'm not changing the transformers. Now, part of the reason that the BIDX 20 may not be performing well is because of this output transformer here on the IRF 510. Because if you look at the, impedance, the uh, inductance, it's quite low. And you look at the inductance here at uh, the uh, uh, bit X40, it's much higher. So this um, that may explain why the bit X40 performs better at higher frequencies. Okay, so then uh, I went and looked at the micro bit X, which it's, um, he's using push-pull configuration as well as he's doing parallel transistors. So he's using a push-pull IRF 510 configuration, and he's using a push-pull driver, but he's using parallel uh, 3904s just to allow him to have more gain and less heat dissipation in these uh, 3904s. Because I think that's why they use the uh, 2219 uh, transistor here, because it's got a higher... Uh, it could uh, put out a lot higher wattage. So by him paralleling this and doing a push-pull, he could potentially drop the power output, uh, the power dissipation from these transistors quite a bit and get a lot more power being pushed through. Same thing with the pre-driver. He's got uh, 3904s paralleled. And if you look at his transformers, they're all 10 uh, uh, trifiler turns and... Uh, you know, it's all 36 uh, micro Henry's um, inductance, right? So, and if we look at this, we see that we get only 8 dB roll off here. 
And uh, the micro bid X power amp is supposed to be a multi-band uh, power amp. So that looks really good. So then I, I went and I looked at this because I, I had this kit, um, this WA2EBY um, kit. He did a power amp. He had his for QST or QEX. He, he won a contest for a power amp. It got published and uh, Far Circuits published a kit, a board for it, and uh, it became very pop, pop, popular. So I decided to take a look at this. Now, this is just an amp. It needs about a one watt drive. There's no preamp here. So I thought, let me take a look and see how this amp performs. And uh, so with, you know, about a one watt drive, this thing is pretty solid right across the bands. Like down here in uh, 30 meters, you know, uh, 30, uh, meters and 20 meters you, it dips down a little bit but it's pretty solid it's it's in the 40s right across 40 db gained but a 5 db variation so that amp looks pretty darn good so then i took a look at the han summers um amp which is a push pull he's got same push pull and he uses two bs 170s to drive that and uh, uh, Ken, uh, I, I was asking Ken a comment because uh, I ran into all kinds of problems with this uh, modeling, this amplifier. And Ken mentioned that this is basically a duplicate of the Tony Parks uh, amplifier he had for, was it the um, hard, not the hard rock, what's the soft rock? Yeah, soft rock. Yeah, so it was basically the soft rock. So he had a very, very similar amp. So I think Hans Summers lifted that from Tony Parks. Tony Parks probably lifted it from someone else. Uh, the only thing that I saw was that uh, there was some discussion about uh, putting a 75 ohm termination resistor here at the front to improve it. I tried it with without this. I tried every which way. I could not get this amp to work well. I was getting a 16 dB roll off, 20 dB gain, and it just, the amp would not work well. And if you look at, you go to Hans Summers' uh, documentation, he had people do independent testing of this amp, connect it up to like uh, um, spectrum analyzers, and they were getting, you know, like a variation of a few dB across the bands. They weren't seeing 16 dB roll off and they weren't seeing, they were seeing upwards of 24, 25 dB of gain. So something's wrong with this. And the only thing I could think of, there was this one circuit he had in his, uh, <coughs> in his um, uh, model, which was basically a temperature compensating circuit. So this, this line here was feeding the gain here for the, um, to feed the, not the gain, the bias, sorry, was feeding the bias to bias these BS 170s. I just, uh, from my model, I just fed it in. I didn't want to model that because in his model, I can't remember which ones of these uh, MOSFETs is actually um, attached to the BS 170s. So when it heats up, this thing puts out less bias and it pulls back the gain. So it's like a temperature compensating circuit. So that's the only thing, the only difference, but I couldn't do it. I wasn't gonna troubleshoot it. And I said, you know what, just shoot the rabbit at this point. I'm not going down that rabbit hole of trying to figure out why that amp isn't working. Can I say something quickly here? Sure. Yeah. Um... Back when I started back in the hobby, I started with one of Tony's kits. And uh, I found out that if you bought uh, the BS-170 from uh, a supplier or even China, that those BS-170s, they had to match almost perfectly. If they didn't match, it didn't work correctly. Yeah, but so, this, this is a simulation, Ken, where... Oh, okay, yeah. 
wear these BS 170s. They're 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 identical. Yeah. No, no. I uh, I just want to throw that in there just in case you know if you came across building one and and it wasn't working correctly. That's what the yeah. No, would be. I'm not going to bother you. I actually bought one. I have a kit. When I was a date in I think 2019, uh, I think I bought one of his kits and it's sitting here. And so maybe I should build it, test test it. But so this is my analysis. What I found, and I've just got a couple more slides and I'm done. So um, so I'm seeing significant roll off here. The, the micro bit X was a little bit better. The bit X20 was terrible. Now, is it because of that transformer? Is it because of MOSFET capacitance? You know, is it something else? You know, independent testing of the Han Summers amp, you know, was good. I couldn't get it to work, so I'm just going to throw it out. I'm not even going to bother. I said, you know what, the Han Summers, I'm not even going to bother looking uh, at, at that any further. But definitely the WA2EBY, the BIDX40 and the micro BIDX, they seem to have much flatter response. You know, with the WA2EBY, it's that's definitely a, a good amplifier, but it needs one watt drive. And so you'd need to put like a preamp, some kind of preamp there, which by adding that, that may limit the bandwidth of the amp. So that's definitely some something for me to take a look at and play around with. And I think someone recently posted a message on the forum asking about where to get parts or boards or something for that WA2EBY uh, amplifier. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, filters. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't remember filters or amps or something. But so, you know, I'm not going to boil. So going, f when I looked at those um, amplifiers, I said, I'm not going to boil the ocean. I am going to take the those, uh, those MOSFETs, the IRF 510 and those other MOSFETs, which looked pretty good. I'm just going to drop them in as is. I'm not going to go and tune transformers or tune things. I'm just going to plug it in and see if it works better. I'm not going to boil the ocean here, trying to design a better amp. I'm just, I'm just basically wanted to see if a different MOSFET in these amplifiers would perform better. So, what I needed, this is what I need to go and do in order to do that. You know, I would have to select the MOSFET bias. Right, so I'd have to um, get to set a bias. Then I'd have to figure out the input drive level. Then I'd have to measure the um, purity coming out, because I'd have to make sure I'm 44 dB. My harmonics are at least 44 dB below the carrier, below the uh, uh, fundamental uh, frequency I'm putting out. Uh, I need to measure output power. Uh, I need to also look at the power being dissipated by these devices because sure, I could drive the crap out of them. LT Spice will say, you're putting out 100 watts, but the device is putting out 200 watts and it's going to melt down, right? You're going to have the uh, China syn syndrome. And you got to also measure input, output, impedance. So there's a lot of things to measure. And if I was to do this manually, running a simulation, going and measuring waveforms would take me forever. So I have to figure out how to do automated measurements. And that'll be another talk where I'll talk about how to do automated measurements in LT Spice. Then I have to figure out how to do uh, FFTs in LT Spice. I thought I could, but man, did I not know how to do it. So basically my strategy was, there's a whole bunch of things I had to measure and control and, and what I would do is I would adjust some of these things that only measure these things, the purity. So I'd measure what, what the signal coming out is, what the harmonics coming out is. I'd measure the output power and I'd measure the power dissipation. So I would select optimum. So I'd adjust these parameters, stick in a MOSFET, adjust the, the parameters and select the best purity, the best output power, and the lowest power dissipation. And of course, I'd have to factor in the low pass filter. And my final slide here is just a word about low pass filter. So, so if you, I look at a little bit of math, you know, you know, for, we needed 44 dB. 
uh, down. So, and if you look at the power of the harmonic versus the power of the of the fundamental, or the voltage of the harmonic volts versus the voltage of the fundamental, you know, I could work out the ratio just by doing some math to find out the voltage of the harmonic must be at most 0.63% of uh, the, the fundamental. So whatever voltage the fundamental is, I have to be at uh, below 0.63% of it, right? So, and uh, so I, that's what I wanted to go and do without looking at the power amp, because if you look at the, here is the uh, the harmonics. So this is the um, the dB below the uh, fundamental that uh, you get from a typical power amp. Here's the second harmonic, third harmonic, four, fourth harmonic for 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters. And if you look at, and so, and this is, if I slot in a low pass filter now to that power amp and I measure the harmonics, this is what I'm seeing. So here, if I look at the second harmonic for 20 meters, the filter is knocking it down 49 dB. So, you know, that in itself, it's knocking it down 49 dB, which is well beyond 44. So I could be almost at plus five dB. Uh, above the carrier and I'd still be within legal limits. So my rule was I'd said, okay, I would uh, out get select an output by the power amp that the harmonics has to be well below zero uh, uh, dBC. So in summary, uh, going forward, that's what I kind of would do is that I would assume all components are okay, only adjust the biases and the gains. I would just plug in different MOSFETs. I would measure the spectral purity, measure the harmonics, measure the output power, measure the power dissipation, forget about the low pass filter. Um, so I just picked some value below zero dBC, some arbitrary value and I'd work towards that. And I would select the best amp. So in my next talk, I'll talk about how to do an FFT and LT spice. And then in a subsequent talk, I'll, I'll talk about uh, doing, uh, making uh, automated measurements and how I was able to quickly go and analyze these amps. So that's it.